Hi, I'm Kelly Kramer. And I'm Scott Zipker. Welcome to a very special program on Iowa Public Television. Devoted entirely to the Eagles of Decora. Funding for Iowa Outdoors is provided by the Claude P. Small, Catherine Small Cousins, and William Carl Cousins Fund at the Lincoln Way Community Foundation in Clinton County to support nature programming on Iowa Public Television. And by the Alliant Energy Foundation. Many of Iowa's natural wonders you'll find on Iowa Public Television can be found in Iowa Outdoors Magazine, the Iowa DNR's premier resource for conservation, education, and recreation activities. Subscription information can be found online at iowadnr.gov. Welcome to Northeast Iowa's Decorah Fish Hatchery, nestled amid the bluffs of Winnesheet County. Thousands of trout emerge from these waters via an intense breeding program with the Iowa DNR. And it's also home to the world famous Decorah Eagles. The unique thing about this nest is that it's right across from a state fish hatchery. All the fish hatchery guys, they laugh about it and they think it's kind of cool that they, they see them go down and take the trout once in a while. This particular location is awesome because these birds are totally used to people on lawnmowers, barking dogs, and I can sit here without being in a blind, standing right here, and the eagles would behave totally normally. You know, at first when I, saw, I looked at this female, I thought there was something kind of funny about her head. But then I noticed when I got this long lens on that she was missing an eye. And to me, that makes it even more remarkable that she is so successful at, at hunting and taking fish. Because a raptor has to have death perception. And without two eyes, it's just staggering that she can be as successful as she is. Reddick would film segments of the PBS Nature program from his perch near the hatchery. Together with Bob, they built a nest camera to document the Eagle family. The next year, the camera became a live feed destined for global stardom. Last year, we had 78,000 unique computers logging on from 130 countries, and I thought that was incredible. This year, my webmaster, Amy Reese, was able to send a 24-7 feed uh, to you stream. It's almost like watching live TV and it's gone viral. I'm really hoping that we've got the sites from every country on the planet. That's my hope is every country on planet Earth is logged on. But it is right now it, with over 100 million total views, it's the most watched video stream on the internet. Their food, uh, yeah, it's uh, been a good buffet for them. <laughs> I think that's probably a, a big reason why I, they stick around here. Well, I saw one of them carry a hind quarter of a fawn, a deer up there with the, just the legs sticking out, you know, he had the hind quarter he was going up to the nest with, you know. But they've uh, carried a lot of different things up there. From documentaries to the worldwide web stream of an eagle nest, Bob's work opened hearts and minds to the comeback of an American symbol. But few escape nature's wrath, including the eagles of Decora. Nest collapsing is bald eagle biology. All bald eagle nests eventually collapse. They add about 200 pounds of sticks to their nest every single year. So after 10 years, that's a ton of nesting material. And in this case, it's a cottonwood tree where the limbs are known to be pretty fragile. So that nest could come down tomorrow. It could come down in five years. There's no way for us to call the shots on that. 
and that the reason why they came to that tree where they're at, their old nest collapsed. Well, I don't know if it's a danger, but it's a perpetual worry in Bob's brain. I mean, it really is. I mean, I, I mean, it's constantly going through my mind, you know, what, what happens when the computer goes down or what happens if the nest collapses? You know, it's really out of our control to, and I have to tell myself that, but I stew about it and I, and I do worry about it. Bob Anderson's concerns met reality in the summer of 2015. A microburst of high-speed wind surged through Decorah, Iowa. A massive section of cottonwood trees snapped. The nest, watched by thousands online, tumbled to the Iowa soil. The nearly decade-long experiment to showcase Decorah's eagles was seemingly over. But Bob's band of helpers hatched an experimental plan to resurrect the nest. Um, immediately, uh, several of us said um, it might be a good idea to, to try to, to build a man-made nest. It has been done before by a couple other organizations. I know there's one organization in Canada that's been successful at doing this. Um, not only for the Eagle Cam, I think for the benefit of the Cam, but also for the benefit of the area, keeping the eagles here. It's a great area, habitat-wise, for them to be in, and it's a very safe area. It's not like it's never been done before. There's, there is literature on doing it, and people have done it successfully. But I think people, because they're engaged in this and they're part of the story, they were really excited and interested about what would happen next. So it's not sort of a hypothetical nest that somebody built once that they've never really heard about. This is their nest, and these are their eagles. Within days of the collapse, Bob approved the plan, but then fell ill. He would die only days later, leaving his dream in doubt. His life's work and the efforts of dozens more would mark the beginning of a new chapter for the Eagles of Decora. One of the things Bob Anderson did before he passed away was he connected uh, all of us as a group of people. It went really quick. I mean, memorial, celebration of life, service for Bob. The next week was planning and building N2B. I mean, we were back basically hatching that plan and figuring out what the details were going to be uh, right after that, knowing how serious that was. We've got a window of about August and September that we are able to get up into a nest and do work in it, so we knew that we had just this little time window. Right before Bob passed away, uh, we came up with an idea. I was, I couldn't sleep one night, and I, I came up with this brainstorm. Why don't we rebuild a nest in, in either in a tree, in the same tree, because I didn't understand the tree completely severed off. And then I ran it by Bob, and about five days later, he called. This is when he was quite sick. And he said, oh, this is an awesome idea. We gotta do it, you know? And so he was so excited. I thought, well, we gotta do it. We've gotta carry on Bob's dreams. And so we're here today. The original nest, uh, which is right in these severed trees behind me, blew down in some enormous wind that came through, oh, I don't know, it was about two and a half, three weeks ago. Yeah, this is the original nest N2 that came down in the storm. This is the tree. You can see the great super crotch that they, they chose. It was a good site. And the tree looks solid. We don't, you, know, you can look up in the trees, three big branches broken. So you can see the event that happened. The trees are not rotten. And you can see the size. This is still a young nest. Uh, the process, well, it first involves finding a good crotch, a good branch configuration that's going to hold a nest and you know we want to make sure that there's easy flying access for the eagles coming and going and it happened that we found this almost perfect uh, branch configuration and it turned out to be quite close to the site of the old nest pull a climbing rope up go up and then build the foundation, which consisted of uh, four two-by-fours bolted onto the tree. And 
then we put kind of a bag of mesh, fill that with nesting material and just start adding sticks. Almost like making a giant Christmas wreath. One stick at a time until we got it to where it is now and it's looking like an eagle nest. There has been eagle, you know, artificial nests made and eagles have occupied them. So, I mean, it's, it's not an original idea. It's the first time we've ever done it. I've done it with red-tailed hawk nests to attract owls for filming purposes and things like that. So this is a first time for me, but I, I think it, you know, there's a darn good chance it'll work. Because Bob did it, we're gonna do it just kind of as a ritual, but we're gonna put in a, a couple of a dead squirrels up there. And you know, sometimes Bob, after climbing up and installing cameras, he'd leave a treat for the eagles, either a dead squirrel, a rabbit, or maybe a, a fresh trout from the fish hatchery. So we're gonna do that today. If Bob was here right now, he'd be jumping up and down. And, you know, we'd probably all be celebrating with a couple of beers afterwards. He would have been happy as hell. And then hopefully wait to see if they came. And I think it was the last week of September that we were finishing up the camera work. We put a couple trout from the trout hatchery up into the nest and by about a half a week they turned into trout jerky and then we saw like early October I think it was like a Monday or Tuesday mom came after the owls we also had some great horned owls in there kind of looking over the nest to see what they thought and eagles got in there and they pretty much claimed it and it really started building that nest right after that early October they started bringing branches in and they they built that thing up several feet and several feet in diameter. Oh, that was such a feeling of accomplishment. I mean, it was so, I say it's a feeling of accomplishment, but it's, it's the eagles that came back, but it was just like, this was everything that we hoped for. By mid-February, the first egg was laid. Four days later, egg number two was visible. And three days later, egg number three was seen worldwide on the Decora Eagle Nest camera. For the volunteers and members of the Raptor Resource Project, these fresh eggs in the man-made nest were a moment of relief, quickly followed by anxious anticipation. The first hatch would come one month later, after even more ice and snow. In late March of 2016, wildlife cinematographer and the brainchild behind the Mad Maid Nest, Neil Reddick, got a call from John Howe, the new director of Raptor Resource. The day they've been waiting for had arrived. All right. And let's just take a look at mom there. Beautiful shot. And they have just built this rim up around here. Everybody has just been going crazy because <laughs> we can hardly see in there, you know, very rarely. Just this morning was the first views, as far as I know. Although we've been tracking the, uh, the crack and the, the hole in the egg now for two days. She's hovering a little bit more. Uh, it, they, they do that once a chick is a, or an eaglet is actually hatched. She'll kind of sit more as, a, as an umbrella cover over them and won't sit down quite as tight to the eggs as, as she had been. So I was figuring it would be more towards the middle of when the three had been laid. They're almost exactly three days apart for all three chicks. Hey, what do you think? Look at this. Hey, well, You're papa. <laughs> That's it right there. Look, look at, at that. Oh this is our first real good shot. He might actually oh, look at this. I mean, here here's what we were just talking We'll see about. if if there's any possibility of feeding. I'm not sure. Incredibly powerful talons around that delicate little baby. The way she's boiling him up is awesome. Look at that. 
when I got the the, the news, I actually started to, <laughs> I started to cry. Uh, I know you told so me that. Uh, because you know, I mean, this this is like the culmination of a lot. Of it is dreams <laughs> <laughs> for Bob. <laughs> That's awesome. I can't believe it. Look at that. As the Eagle family continued their journey, a second egg would hatch. As the days passed into weeks, the Raptor resource team knew the inevitable. The third egg would not hatch. And this was the first year since these eagles have been tracked that one of the eggs did not hatch. So, you know, we looked at that. We know the biological reasons. Either it didn't get fertilized or something happened during the development of that that eaglet inside that egg that did not continue. The only chance they might have to learn more about the third egg would come six months later during a September window to climb up to the eagle nest. But long before that, the Raptor Resource Project would call up an old friend to continue a banding and tracking program vital to eagle research. Well, there are many questions to be answered yet. You know, I mean, D1 sparked a lot of interest, you know, I mean, the fact that she flew where she did, um, is this atypical? One bird, you never know. So you try to want to try to want to get more transmitters out there to see if that was an aberration or if that may be fairly typical. We also want to look at sibling dispersal. Do siblings from the same nest travel together or independently? So that was something we are striving to learn more about. In summer 2016, both Decora eaglets would be fitted with transmitters. Within months, Brett discovered one of the eaglet's flight data was stationary on a rural highway. The eaglet was struck by a vehicle likely during a roadkill feeding. It's just one of the realities Brett has discovered with Decorah's eaglets. While some have explored the Midwest and Canada, others have exhibited high mortality rates from power poles. Well, Decorah is not your typical rural setting for a bald eagle nest, obviously. People all around and the birds are acclimated to that and to traffic and all kinds of noise um, and there are power poles everywhere. They're attractive perches, they're easy to access uh, and they're everywhere. You know your perspective of power poles changes a little bit after you have one of your eagles get electrocuted because you notice them everywhere around town and the whole suburban area where the, the nest is. When the Raptor resource team gathered in September, it was time to replace the nest cameras and bring in some climbing experts. The, the wiring is very complex and very lengthy. As you can tell, we have hundreds of yards of wiring. Uh, that's what we're focusing on, and hopefully the climbers focus on their job and don't have any problems. My name is Kike Arnau. I'm from Venezuela, South America. Pretty good tool, huh? This thing is, works great. Mm -hmm. I was climbing uh, harp eagles uh, trees back in the day in the neotropics in Panama, the Aran jungle, and the Amazon. Trees are smaller here. Um, these cotton, cotton wood trees are beautiful, but they are a little fragile, which is not very nice. You know, they, they break something that we climbers don't like very much to happen when you're up, up in the tree. But yeah, forest is forest. You know, the forests in the neotropics are very different because of all the bugs and all the, the, the diversity of, of insects, you know, and, but I think both forests are just spectacular. Very efficient technique, but you, the, the starting point, you need a good, uh, um, set up of the rope. We are, we are trying to get more than one branch to get the line across. Why is that? Because if one branch, by for any chance, one bra branch breaks and you're hanging from the rope, then there's another branch that will stop your falling. Very end, you do again the same knot that I did. The first one? The first one, you do it at the very end and tie it very, very strong. 
I think that'll do it, KK. All right. You pull it, and when I tell you, you release it. Yep. So you try to get high, you try to get a rope uh, close to the nest. It can be too far away, because how do, how, then how do you get, how do you ask, access, get closer to the nest? It's impossible. Well, it's actually super cool. Um, the eagles, they managed to get this spectacular view of the surroundings, you know. I guess this is very important for them to be able to see everywhere, you know, for other predators coming to attack the chicks, for example, like or, or net owls, you know. Uh, also a place where they can just dive and hound, you know, they can move very quickly. So in general, any eagle nest that I remember has an incredible view. Usually in the, in the beginning, we wouldn't replace these cameras every every year. We would uh, wait uh, probably two years. I think Bob was, was giving two two to three years in some of the cameras, as long as they were working. I think now the technology is changing so quickly that it's it's worth doing this work every year. We prepare, uh, me along with uh, my wife Ann and, and John Ha, we're preparing the electronics, the cameras, getting them set, uh, making sure they work, wiring them, getting the wire out, making the wire ready to go up into an eagle's nest. These illuminators are 120 degrees okay. out to the side, so there's you can't miss it, but I would, if you can imagine a plane going out like this, we want it going right, right at the Y branch. This is an omnidirectional microphone. Yep. Don't screw it too tight or it might strip and bust. Moving the, the, the cameras and zooming in at these opportune moments, I think that's the, it just almost sends a, a chill down your spine basically thinking, this is so amazing. And it's just to be involved in being, being able to bring that out for people to watch and enjoy, uh, being a part of that is amazing. It's gonna go like that. If you put it there, you, you will be able to see the illuminator. When it turns out, you're gonna will see. This, will this be in view of the camera? Oh, we, we hide it, but the illuminator has this large uh, infrared. It's infrared. The Allen key that he gave us to for the microphone. That's actually one thing exciting about our maintenance activities that we're down here doing this week, and that is that we are actually going to look into the nest and see if that egg is still there. Uh, we got that opportunity to take a look at that. Nobody uh, saw the egg being kicked out of the nest or it looked like it just got buried through the season. So you know so. what is important when, that when we get to the, to the nest, don't stand in the middle of the nest. Right. So we, right. if the egg is there, we right. don't compress more. The one on the right is the one that it's they like. They, that's the one that they like to fly up yeah. and come up and sit. So I, don't, I think we would stay off of that branch. Okay. Now move this way. You know, an egg is made to be pretty, pretty stable, you know, against compression. So, there it is. There, oh, we see the egg. Whoa! <laughs> it was down in there, yeah. underneath. Wow, great news. Great news, That's is right. We found the egg. <laughs> One of those little pictures, right? <laughs> we will want the bag up. It looks like it's fully intact. I think what we're actually seeing here is something very special also. Uh, there's not many times in, in one's life you get to hold <clears throat> a, an eagle egg in your hand and have permission to do so. <laughs> our, per our permit right. is, uh, right. is allowing us to retrieve this egg today. Even just six weeks after they hatch and then they, they fledge, those birds are pretty big and they come from this little egg here. So kind of cool, but it is pretty heavy. And uh, it's an honor. Surprisingly basically. to me, pretty solid. Yeah. You called it. And this is the first time we've had one that did not hatch and, and we don't know why, but maybe we'll find out. All right, here we go. Transfer. All right. 
That actually was a surprise to me because we haven't seen that before and we did get the egg autopsy and they found that it had never been fertilized. So I'm glad we were able to recover the egg. I wrote a blog about it after we got the report back. It was one of the more read blogs that I've done. I, it was over 26,000 people read it. So uh, there was a lot of interest in why the egg didn't hatch. The story of these raptors mirrors the greater tale of the American Eagle, a mix of triumph, tragedy, and resilience. It's a tale woven into the backbone of Decorah and the heart of a man who made these eagles the centerpiece of an entire community. For more than a decade, the eagles of Decorah have been chronicled through film and live stream, through rain and snow, and with a team of passionate supporters from across the country as future bald eagle research still unfolds in this picturesque corner of Iowa, the goals of the late Bob Anderson continue. My gut right off says he'd be really proud. I think he'd be relieved um, knowing that it wasn't going to end with him. Um, I think that was his whole purpose was to get as many people ex as so passionate and excited as he was to carry on what it was that he worked 30, 40 years to do. Bob was concerned that Raptor Resource Project continue after he was gone. He always said, this can't end with me. And I think right now, I hope he's looking down, um, thrilled at what we're doing uh, and happy. I think he'd be thrilled if he was here. He'd be thrilled at the new technology we have and um, the amount of work I think that everyone's willing to do. He would be very proud of everything that's going on here because John has really kept everything going and improving everything. Everyone here in Decorah knows Bob and knew him and a lot of the work that he did. So I think, you know, the big thing there is just, I think Bob would be happy with where things have gone here and the dedication to making sure that that continues. Uh, that was really one of the biggest things that I heard is, Boy, everyone in the Decor area, you know, everyone across the world who loves these eagles, we just, we got to keep this thing going. If you're interested in learning more about the Decor eagles, visit our extensive video archive of features at iptv.org slash Iowa Outdoors. We'll leave you now with some more images of Iowa's world-famous raptors. Funding for Iowa Outdoors is provided by the Claude P. Small, Catherine Small Cousins, and William Carl Cousins Fund at the Lincoln Way Community Foundation in Clinton County to support nature programming on Iowa Public Television. And by the Alliant Energy Foundation. Many of Iowa's natural wonders you'll find on Iowa Public Television can be found in Iowa Outdoors Magazine, the Iowa DNR's premier resource for conservation, education, and recreation activities. Subscription information can be found online at iowadnr.gov.